and the Future of the Digital Exchange, uh, featuring six experts from the Leading Alternative Trading Systems, or ATS as you all know, and security token platforms. During this session, we will discuss the potential of digital security tokens, how blockchain-based ATSs and platforms facilitate capital flows, and we will also examine the most pressing challenges facing our industry. The most constructive takeaway from this session will be the creative solutions proposed by our panelists to address regulatory hurdles, liquidity enhancements, quality of offerings, and of course, compliance. So let's start with a brief introduction of our panelists. I'll go box by box. Um, I know it's very small on my screen, but uh, I'll try to zoom in here. We'll start with Scott on the top left. You give a brief introduction of yourself and Securitize. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am the CEO of Securitize Markets. Um, also lead our transfer agent business, and I'm happy to be here this morning with everyone. Great. Uh, Sean, great to see you. Yeah, sure, you too, Dominic. Uh, my name is Sean Bowden. I'm the CEO and CCO of Simbridge Capital. Uh, we're a digital asset security ATS located in Greenwich, Connecticut. Great. Good old Greenwich. Uh, Richard, great to see you. Hi, Dominic. My name is Richard Johnson. I'm the founder and CEO of Texture Capital. We're a digital securities broker dealer focused on primary issuance and secondary trading of uh, digital securities. Definitely. And Alex? Hey. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Alex Vlastakis. I'm the president of T0 ATS. Uh, T0 has been around since 2014 and uh, has a vision of integrating blockchain technologies into the capital markets arena. Pleasure to be here today. And Alan, hello. Hello, Alan Silbert, CEO of North America for INX. Uh, we are a licensed broker dealer in ATS for securities and also a cryptocurrency trading platform. Welcome, Alan. And Pat. Thank you, Dominic. Hi, Pat Lebecki, yes, CEO and founder of Oasis Pro Markets, 25 plus years investment banking at Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, Bear Stearns. Uh, we're a multi asset digital ATS. Uh, we'll be launching in March of this year. And uh, we're based in Darien, Connecticut. And also, we're a full service investment bank. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, and just some brief uh, instructions. I want to make this more discussion based. I have some targeted questions. But if you do want to chime in, just put one finger up and I'll, I'll call on you. And then for the folks joining in, um, there is a comment box where you can have questions. And I think Sophia will uh, on ARC's teams will facilitate that. So we'll probably get to some of those uh, most relevant. Um, so just starting off the discussion, you know, we heard from Hester Pierce this morning, and there's been a lot of talk about the regula regulatory uh, hurdles. So we'll start with that and just a general uh, overview of ATS. So I'll turn this over to Scott. How do you define ATSs and what is their potential for adoption generally? Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, based on these type of forums, we're starting to see that the momentum is picking up in a meaningful way, right? I think that you're starting to see a lot more trust in the system, right? And I think trust is key to liquidity. And so, you know, I think with these type of forums give everyone the opportunity to learn more about what we all do and how we operate, because I think generally with the goal of building more liquidity, these forums are wonderful for having folks understand more about the process and it becomes less mysterious. Definitely. And then um, I'll turn it over to Richard from Texture. Uh, talk to us about how you apply smart contracts to streamline the compliance process and how do we help all stakeholders, regulatory, issuers, investors understand blockchain's functionality? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, so um, let's, you know, let's step back a little bit perhaps on that question. I think uh, what I was really, you know, what I think all of us here have been attracted to this space was having seen what was going on in crypto. We saw some you know, tremendous opportunities with uh, what was happening with Bitcoin and Ethereum and some very strong applications towards the security space things around transparency, transferability, and so forth. Um, so what an ATS does is, you know, it's essentially it's, it stands for Terms of Trading System. It's, um, you know, part of, you know, the SEC's Reg ATS and the Exchange Act, and it allows, it facilitates matching of buyers and sellers. Uh, here at Texture, we're focused on the, on the private markets, because I think that's a, uh, a really great uh, you know, space to build and to, and, and to start developing out this technology. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is that there's not a lot of existing technology in place. So it's kind of a greenfield to go out there 
and, uh, and and try to build a new market structure based on blockchain. The benefits of kind of you know, how we use smart contracts, and I think a lot of folks using smart contracts is what, what we're doing, first of all, we're recording the securities on the blockchain. So you have a complete, you have a record of securities ownership and, uh, and, and, and a complete history, you know, complete transaction history. So that's a lot better than you currently have in private markets. I often, I often say that the, the main innovation in private markets over the last 20 years is DocuSign. Um, mm-hmm. So we want to improve on that by having this digital ledger. Uh, so once you've got that, it's recorded on the ledger, you can apply the smart contracts, which are basically computer programs, um, and they enable us to kind of streamline all the complex compliant rules. Specifically in private markets, we're talking about uh, you know, Rule 144, which is a one-year holding period, uh, or, or maybe it's 4A7. There's maximum number of holders, which could be 2,000 for an operating company. It could be 99 for a fund. Uh, these are things we're focused on. And there's going to be, you know, and you can think of any kind of type of you know, constraint or, or control or compliance rule you want to program in, uh, you know, in, in, in public markets like what uh, you know, ARCA is doing with the registered fund as well. So the, the goal is to kind of use this technology, this digital ledger and the smart contracts to streamline liquidity and, and facilitate the interaction of buyers and sellers so that we get more liquidity in these markets. Great. And do you feel like there's a general understanding across stakeholders, especially regulators, on the, the blockchain's functionality? I think there is now, yes, I think so. I mean, it, you know, they've been, you know, you're looking at it quite heavily uh, for a while. So there's understanding for sure. Um, I, I don't know if there's uh, as much openness as we would like. I think there's... Uh, you know, certainly some of the, the, the comments we've been seeing has, have been suggesting that they're not, you know, there's a lot of constraints on us. The last panel was talking about, there's a question about, you know, firm, firms moving overseas because there hasn't been enough kind of regulatory guidance and things like that. Great. And it still feels like we're very early stage. I remember the discussion I had with Scott one-on-one was there's still the need to maintain a traditional book entry. Uh, so there is still some, you know, traditional hurdles. Um, and it seems like there needs to be greater trust on the blockchain from the SEC. Alex, I think you want to chime in? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, what I wanted to add, and I think, uh, you know, I think Richard and, and Scott, they hit it on the, on the nose. But um, I think it's important to, to remember an ATS as a, as, a, um, as a venue is not a new idea. Right. These are, you know, alternative trading systems have been around for decades. Um, They've traded securities for decades. The um, what I think is new and and exciting about security tokens and digital assets at large is the innovation and the tech enhancements that they're bringing to the, you know, the settlement and trading and clearing of these securities. Um, you know, so first and foremost, I think, you know, we've been speaking to the regulators for quite some time. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, T0 has been started in this, pro- in this business in 2014. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, we're very excited that the regulators are actually have been very engaged, as Richard mentioned. Um, the, you know, early on, it was, it, you know, it was kind of a, it was a scary and unknown product. And now, you know, the education has um People and participants have been educated on the products. They've been educated on some of the advancements. And I think Richard highlighted perfectly, um, you know, some of the benefits to uh, blockchain securities as it relates to some of the compliance features that we can add to that. Pat? Thank you. Um, Going back to the original question, uh, we didn't get into this uh, for the technology improvement of blockchain which is obvious, it's very simple. Perfect data, lower costs, zero counterparty risk, faster payments, and over time the investor base will grow. So it's, it's an evolution of the technology of electronic transactions right now to the digital sp- space us- utilizing technology. But frankly, our team, and when we started this, uh, this journey down the digital ATS side, we were focused on DeFi and what was happening in the DeFi space. And that's what we're most excited about because there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, interest in regards to some disintermediation, but also um, increased efficiencies utilizing DeFi. So that was our approach to this. We can do instantaneous settlements right now. We uh, we can settle in digital cash. Um, we, We can do instantaneous settlements with our custodian at Anchorage. Um, and on the DeFi space, uh, it's it's not just verbiage on our part. We also 
are very involved with uh, um, one of the oldest DeFi uh, platforms called uh, Maker or the Maker ecosystem, who's also an investor with us now called UDHC. So we're, we're thinking beyond blockchain and improvements and electronic uh, trading. What we're thinking about is the next step. Now it's moving to Web 3.0. We've been on Web 2.0 for three years. We're about real world assets into DeFi. That's when it's where it's going to get excited. On the regulatory front, I would add, uh, you know, I'm sure with the rest of these guys, uh, because our bills are quite high, uh, we speak to the... Uh, to the regulators all the time. I think the improvement over the last three years of their knowledge base is fantastic. They are uh, forward thinking. Uh, the grayness of the regulations, in my opinion, is going to continue for the next two to three years. And our approach is to be heavily regulatory and compliance forward, because at the end of the day, along the lines of the ATS proposals that came out yesterday, we believe as an ex-Wall Streeter that that um, despite what's occurred in the uh, limited um, limited guidance that eventually the SEC, CFTC, FINRA and other governing bodies are going to have their fingerprints all over this. And, uh, you know, we welcome it. Great, great. And then uh, touching on that regulatory front, we all know that there has been this shift from the four step to the three step. Um, Sean from Simbridge, you apply for your FINRA license back in December 2021 for approval under that three-step process. And then the guidance came out a few weeks before that, right? Uh, so talk to us about the benefits of the three-step versus the four-step. And do these rules fully acknowledge the blockchain aspect? Yeah, so uh, we were very fortunate. We had an internal deadline to file our, uh, our FINRA application. And the three-step process guidance came out uh, a week before that. So mm -hmm. we quickly got out our racers and... Uh, we re redrafted our application. Um, so essentially the rules streamline the settlement process by allowing the ATSs to directly convey settlement instructions to the custodian on behalf of the customers. Mm -hmm. um, it's critical, it was a critical step moving the trading of digital asset securities towards more mainstream securities trading processes. And as the industry continues to develop and mature, we look forward to regulations evolving to better leverage the benefits of blockchain technology uh, ultimately get into some kind of on-chain settlement. Great. And then I'll turn it over to Alan. Um, INX, right, is building the institutional bridge. Talk to us about how you kind of do that, and particularly in terms of, you know, changing the issuance and trading workflows. Yeah, so, you know, I think this this group, we, I thank all of you for being pioneers in the space. And uh, yeah, it's like Pat said, uh, giving some some kind donations in the form of legal fees to uh, <laughs> to educate and and to get us where we are today. So, um, yeah, you know, like our our vision was always to try to get digital securities in the hands of the general public. And so, you know, so we did spend three years with the SEC and educating them and trying to get them comfortable with uh, you know, with the space, with uh, Ethereum blockchain is what we use. And, you know, and to do that, you have to be super transparent. Um, you know, this group doesn't isn't like the uh, the ICO uh, boom and bust of 2017. We wanted to do the total opposite of that and, and show like a good face for this industry and how we can do it the right way. And um, so, you know, I, I think what we showed at INX is that, you know, you, you can do it. Um, and now our prospectus is out there, and we hope that everybody uses it as a boilerplate going, going forward. Um, and it should be a much uh, easier and, and uh, more more painless process than what we went through. But um, but yeah, the, you know the, the regulators got comfortable. I wish it was faster, but now hopefully because of what this group did, what INX did, things can move along at a faster clip, and uh, you can kind of see. And like for instance, our interactions with the SEC and our prospectus—it's all public record. Everybody can see the back and forth, the issues that were discussed and how we rectified them. And, you know, we hope this paves the way for issuers going forward. Great. And then, uh, Scott, you know, we had a really good discussion about the liquidity issue, right? Like, what's the point if there's no liquidity? But there's fast movement, right? And, and the volume will get there. Um, what are you thinking about that? And, and how do we get there to that point of, of uh, greater adoption and larger institutional commitment? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I think as we talked about, right, I think that all of us on this call, right, we're solving for two problems, right, in this space, right? And we're solving for a supply problem 
and a demand problem. And so sort of breaking it down separately, right? On the supply side, I think, you know, we are starting to see momentum. Um, I think you're starting to see more large institutional players taking a more focused interest in digital asset securities. Um, you know, you can see at Securitize, we ourselves, you know, have recently, you know, worked with some meaningful institutional players to, to create product, right? And so on the supply side, I'm very optimistic. I think on the second part of it, right, we're all also focused on the demand side. And, you know, the demand, I think, from our perspective, is slightly more challenging at this point in time. And we've all talked about the regulatory clarity and we've talked about trust and education. But I think all of those components ultimately will help us on the demand side of our business. So, you know, in just the past 12 months, I will tell you that we have seen an incredible momentum building in this space. Um, and so, you know, I'm optimistic that as we all continue to focus on working with the regulators and educating investors, that we'll continue to see that build. Alex, you want to touch on that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I concur with Scott. I think, um, you know, we've been working in an, in an arena right now. I think most of us have been generally, um, well, at least started in, in the area of the private sector, private markets, that is. Um, and that business isn't a liquid market. It's, it's not a very liquid market, you know, at large. Uh, but I think the the um, the vision, at least the vision at T zero, and the vision I, I I'd imagine from most people on this panel is that you know we expand far beyond the private markets. Um, you know, T zero has a joint venture with uh, BSTX, you know, which you know is, is still you know in its approval process. But you know they're trying to to get approval for to become a national market center for digital assets. Um, you know, this this. This technology and the, and the workflow that we're working on today, primarily, I think, in the private space, um, I think that, you know, you can expect to see expansions into, you know, the public markets at large. You know, we're here, you know, we're going to continue to grow. And I think the asset classes that we're working on that perhaps are not showing the liquidity that, um, uh, that we'd like. Frankly, uh, I think that, you know, you're going to continue to see grow into, into product lines that will have more liquidity and more broad usage amongst, you know, Joe public investor. Yeah. And we're not uh, this industry isn't beholden to like traditional investment banks anymore. Uh, you know, we did a direct to market IPO and had over 7000 investors. So, you know, we don't we don't we don't have to, uh, you know, be uh, stuck with the Goldman's and the, and the traditional banks. Yeah, and I, I would just add, you know, I agree with what's been said, but because the part, uh, look, we haven't launched yet, but the, the problem in the industry um, and, and it, through through not through lack of effort is lack of liquidity. I mean, mm -hmm. issuers are being posted, nothing's happening. And uh, eventually a tipping point will occur. A lot of our focus is on large, large companies, multi-billion dollar companies regards to enticing them into this industry, utilizing the blockchain because of the efficiencies that were described earlier. Uh, that's our that's our focus, that's our approach. And then obviously um, incorporate DeFi into that to the best of our knowledge as we work with the regulators on multiple fronts. Um, but a tipping point has to occur. Uh, I completely agree. Eventually the public markets will catch up, but you know, um, from an institutional standpoint, the institutions are there. The custodians are there uh, for digital securities because they're already handling uh, Bitcoin and ETH. They just don't see the demand push from the institutions. When that occurs, they'll be able to turn that on very quickly. Uh, we often hear NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange eventually getting in this market from a equity standpoint. We, we completely see that coming. Yeah, again, when the institutional demand is there. And, and frankly, we think the tech is is there as well um, for that. So eventually there'll be a tipping point. Our approach is larger deals. Uh, in order to have a successful market, you need counterparties to the transactions on both sides. So I think, you know, you know eventually it'll catch up. It's not there now, I, unfortunately. But again, it, that's the exciting aspect of being 
you know, in a nation industry as it grows. And, you know, we may be where crypto was five or six years ago uh, when a lot of folks were shaking their heads. But, hey, Gemini just got an ATS license yesterday. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a huge positive, I think, for this industry. I was Frankly, about to say, yeah. I was about to say just, just one last comment. Uh, what happened with the SEC yesterday in regards to the proposals? It, it What it's telling me is that the approach we took to be regulatory and compliance forward, like everyone else on this panel, was the right bet as well. Sorry, Richard. Here no, we you, you touched on two things I, wanted, I was going to add on. Like You, met, you mentioned you know, you know, crypto five or six years ago. I remember as recently as 2015, Bitcoin was trading $50 million a day, which is you know, nothing compared to what it is now just six years ago. And look at it. It's like, you know, it, it's eating Wall Street, basically. Um, and I think, you know, and I think Rain's kind of stories about the early ETF days as well are very in, in, in constructive as well. So the space is, is, is definitely going to grow. We've got, you know, the, the, the folks at this round table here uh, building out there. And then as you brought it up, Pat, I want to mention those things as well. We, we didn't even have a chance to talk about this in our prep call because it happened yesterday. But the SEC came out with a stonking 675 page uh, amendment proposal for rule ATS, which is what we're all regulated by, basically. Mm -hmm. And I haven't read it <laughs> yet. <laughs> but I've, uh, from what I've been kind of seeing and some of the feedback, including Hester Purse's uh, um, dissent, if you can call it that, it can be very expansive and could uh the way it's written could be included to encompass DeFi activity dexes even it's expanding mm. the definition of an exchange to for, from being purely a marketplace to being a communications protocol which is what a mm. dex is um so i'm sure you know lots of people in, in DeFi aren't going to like that and, and, and they're going to be writing common letters against it and, and whatever but if that's the way it goes down we're ready for it mm. I, I like that uh sean you wanted to touch on that yeah, I think Pat brought up a couple of good points as well. Uh, I want to kind of dovetail off of. Um, I think as we see more issuers testing the space, there will eventually be a tipping point where issuing more digital assets is a common common practice, mm -hmm. we believe, and we're, we're betting on over here. And um, and the other point Pat brought up was uh, the lack of liquidity. Um, you know, we're kind of exploring some options now um, with some other ATSs about having some kind of cross-listing assets amongst the ATSs. I believe that will lead to a lot more liquidity uh, by sharing our, our issuers and our customers amongst each other. Interesting. Okay. And then regarding liquidity, I think we have a comment here from Peter in the audience. Uh, with the lack of derivatives in the digital securities markets, are you seeing any market making capabilities or players into the space? I think we touched on this right during our chat. Anyone want, want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. It's a, it's a very good question because market makers bring about liquidity you know just to explain you know you've got market makers like uh you know, jump trading or virtue or whoever who are posting bids and offers on either side of the market um and they'll they'll buy you know they stand there to buy and they stand up to sell they make their profit as the spread um they tend to end up flat at the end of the day um to, to manage their risk and so forth the, the market we're in, and most of us are in right now, um, certainly in the private market, is not ideal for market making for a couple of reasons. One is the liquidity. A market maker could buy a, buy a security from, a, from somebody who wants to sell um, and not be able to, to, to liquidate it. So they'll be stuck with overnight risk or even you know, multi-day risk, which they, they don't like. And the other thing is shorting. Um, so, you know, market makers will go short. If they don't have inventory, they'll sell, they'll sell and go short. That is something that is not uh, you know, currently in place in, in private markets. However, on the shorting side, I do think that, that I think blockchain technology in general uh, can offer a lot of benefits to market structure there. So I guess to answer the question, um, you know, I, I have heard of a couple of market makers entering the space, but they're looking at it from a um, more of an investing strategy than a traditional market making flat at the end of the day type thing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, we, we've been speaking to market makers since the fall of 20, <clears throat> 2020. And they're all sniffing around the space, the traditional, like Virtu and and uh, Citadel, et cetera. And the, uh, the more crypto focused, like uh, Jump, as Richard had mentioned. Um, 
They, uh, I completely agree. They're, you know, they're uh, none of the ones I mentioned, but I, I, a recent discussion I had with the group was they're more excited about NFTs than digital asset securities because of volume, because they're seeing volume there. And that's really what market makers are drawn to. That being said, I, I do think some are, uh, are, are uh, seeing an opportunity here to dip their toe, maybe from an investment standpoint. I, I don't, I, I really don't see them risking capital as of yet in these markets for digital asset securities, but eventually that'll come. And, uh, but there are other DeFi uh, uh, approaches for liquidity uh, that uh, could be incorporated into, uh, into a, uh, an ATS. And we're exploring those right now. Yeah, well, it's like, uh, you know, for example, we, we have a non-custodial P2P platform. So, uh, you know, MetaMask is, is what we use to bridge the two and, uh, yeah, but that's that's one of the, the best solutions right now for it's like everybody said, uh, you know, with market makers, it's kind of a chicken and the egg issue. You know, they wait for liquidity, but to be there before they enter. But, you know, but we need the we need the liquidity from them. So um, but, you know, uh, MetaMask is growing into a pretty enormous force in the in the uh, in the uh, digital asset world. I think it was 20 to 25 million active users a month. So, so, yeah, there, there, there are options, uh, absent market makers. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, uh, market makers touch regulators. And so, you know, they have to, uh, go and register as a market maker on a digital asset with FINRA and the SEC. So, um, you know, it's another kind of slow iterative, uh, process with the regulators. Uh, it takes a little bit of time. Got it. There's one thing for certain. I know the industry is moving faster than the regulatory <laughs> updates, right? Uh, so I want to touch on the quality issue now, right, in terms of enhancing liquidity over time. Um, I think I had this question posed for Sean at Simbridge. How, how do we, as you know, how do platforms ensure the quality and the credibility of issuers? Yeah, um, I think one thing to reiterate what everyone's kind of saying before, um, we're still broker dealers. Um, we still have the same due, due diligence um, rules applying, applying to us as uh, some of the larger um uh, that's the banks out there. Um, so I, I think it, it's, um, you know, <clears throat> it comes to us, um, an issuer will come to us and we have to ensure that if we don't put quality issuers out in our platform, we're just not going to attract the clients uh, for these issuers. And I think that's the big, big, uh, big challenge in our space is uh, to try to educate the uh, investing public. Uh, if these are true, these are truly valid assets uh, on our exchange. And um, I think that's where we're at today. Can I, can, I just wanted to jump in there real quick, right? Because I, I think this is an important point because I think if you think about even our own personal experience, right, at Securitize, you know, the early adopters in this space, right, clearly had, you know, the challenges that you're referring to in terms of some questions around quality. I think, you know, there's real evidence now that you're starting to see, you know, issuers that, you know, some even public market issuers, as we've talked about, that are starting to really see the value in digital asset securities from multiple perspectives. But I think most importantly, that they see this space as opening up these opportunities to a whole new demographic of investors. And so I see, you know, momentum towards higher quality issuers considering digital asset securities because i think they're now starting to understand the real benefits that they provide if, if i could jump in thank you i uh first of all i think what alan and his team did at inx in raising all that capital go through the sec and an s1 was tremendous um somewhat counter to, uh, to scott's comments were um we're not seeing it on, in regards to the crypto investors wanting to get in, into uh, as of yet, because you know we haven't launched, but we've been having a lot of discussions with groups. We're not seeing that crossover. In fact, when, when companies come to us, because there's adverse selection, honestly, to raise capital through the blockchain, um, those are not the groups that we're working with. You know, we, we decide we're not the right venue for them. What we're trying to focus on is those that can pull investors in. And we think that's how you eventually you get liquidity, et cetera. We, you know, we've been looking at the other platforms. Um, uh, there are about seven or eight out there. And uh, some are really focused on uh, like Reg CF, for instance. And they have a lot of issuers, but they're not actually raising capital. 
So uh, <clears throat> again, going back to the earlier comments about tipping point, mm -hmm. we think that tipping point is drawing in some of these large players. And I, I agree with Scott that a year ago, it was non-existent. Now you've seen a couple of $75 million Reg A plus deals tokenized. You've seen, um, you know, money's uh, raised on the blockchain. But it's all, in, in our opinion, it wasn't because it was a blockchain traded token. It was because the issuer had an installed user base and that user base was, was drawn into the uh, tokenization. But again, eventually it, it, what's going to happen is in five to 10 years, we're going to look back and say, well, why didn't the market move to this space much earlier? Because we're going to have a lot of positive cases. We're going to have success stories. And it's going to be ubiquitous in regards to this technology. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Even as we speak to very large firms, large investment banks, they see it. It's just a question of when. So um, I, I hope Scott's right. We just haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you know, we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of different uh, issuers and wide ranging industries, and they're very uh, impressive use cases. Very interesting. Um, you know, the, the one that we announced recently was an English Premier uh, Soccer League team that uh, wants to you know, wants to tokenize, uh, you know, basically like game day game day revenues. Um, you know, and, and, and they have a captive audience of you know, hundreds of thousands of fans, so it's a great use case. Uh, we're seeing things in the mining industry, both you know, both uh, digital asset and traditional mining, um, healthcare, tourism, um, ESG plays, gaming and app developers. Uh, you know, a, a lot of it's still, it, it, there's still a slow moving wave because, you know, it's inherent on us to educate. And a, a lot of the issuers just um, uh, really uh, need to catch up on the education and learn these processes. Um, amongst a kind of a disjointed regulatory landscape uh, that's very confusing, especially when they come forward with 650 page <laughs> letters for us all to, to uh, delve through. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the issue with the very interesting issuers are out there and they're coming. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's inherent upon us, this group really to educate and, and, and point them in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say, you know, I think Alan tried mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think, you know, the, there has been a shift in discussions with issuers. Um, uh, you know, of course, you know, we've all had our fair share of, of diversified, um, um, you know, players come to us both in the, you know, focus in the, the crypto space and, and then more in the, on the traditional asset space. But, um, you know, I, at T0, we are hearing what, some, you know, I, I can, I can, um, uh, relate to what Scott had mentioned, we are hearing from, you know, publicly traded uh, companies that are interested in um, in issuing, you know, unique, uh, exciting securities, sometimes, you know, uh, to complement what they've had out loud in the market. You know, these are good, solid issuers that, you know, that, that will demand and, and command for, you know, tremendous user base to get more involved in this space. And I think once, you know, we have a few like that actually take place, I do think there's going to be a, um, you know, I think people are going to be forced to pay attention. You know, when, when, when T zero eventually traded OSTKO, our parent company's preferred shares, people were, you know, they came to us, they, you know, frankly, they had to come to us in some, in some ways. And yeah, in a lot of ways, it, 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 it expanded education amongst uh, different, you know, the investor base it, and, and, and for the industry, I think we helped. I think, you know, you know, those were the kind of the types of events that we want to happen to continue to, you know, to um, uh, increase adoption amongst, you know, the, the investing universe. Mm. Good point. That sounds like a tipping point. And we'll get back to that in terms of the public companies. Uh, I think there is another comment here. FTX, CBOE, Coinbase are planning to enter digital asset derivatives markets with CFTC licensees. Uh, will this be a tipping point? Open question. Any comments on that one? We're excited about it. We're doing the same thing. We're going down that path. Uh, we've already started the process. We, we think it's a uh, exciting space and um uh you know oasis pro at the end of the day we have the ats but we have broader ambitions we're moving into other areas and uh, we think that's certainly certainly a, a tipping point erisex ledger x cboe um 
uh, FTX. Uh, there was another one, uh, Truex, I believe. They've all been acquired recently, specifically for crypto derivatives. There's a, a tremendous amount of demand out there. So uh, others on this panel may be doing the same thing, but uh, we, we, we just hired, uh, uh, we expanded our team with uh, derivatives and swaps experience here for this very reason. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add to that? Well, I just, I mean, I think it, it's a good opportunity for uh, for those folks and, and Oasis, I'm guessing. I don't think that's going to have a direct impact on the digital asset security market, though. All right. Not, not in the short term, anyway. Now, uh, it's moving over to the progress on 24-7 trading. Uh, I think we talked in our initial about perhaps like Tesla getting on it or something like that. Uh, Scott, I know you're talking to some traditional companies uh, entering the ATS space or wondering about it. Can you give us an update or your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, on the tw let's start just with the 24 by 7, right? Because we aspire to do that certainly in 2022. Um, you know, we've expanded our ATS trading hours now. I think the whole 24 by 7 is going to tie directly to the demand for it. Right. And so I think at this point in time, there's not enough evidence that it would provide a tremendous amount of benefit in this space. Now, as you continue to evolve the issuer base, as you said, and we start to think about, you know, uh, you know, potentially publicly traded companies, you know, th then I think it becomes more interesting because now you have uh, a much broader investor base where that becomes a, a more meaningful benefit. And, and I think for us, it's securitized specifically. I think if evidence shows us that in the near term, that is a benefit to our investors, we're certainly open to moving towards that quickly. Um, but we just haven't seen evidence that it would do that in, you know, with our current listings. And so we're sort of in a, in a wait and see mode um, on that just you know, because the infrastructure, as you could imagine, right, and everyone on the panel knows to support a 24 by 7 environment takes on a, a much heavier lift. And so I think, you know, uh, you know, we'll continue to monitor it closely. And uh, if the need arises, we'll certainly move towards that. Anyone else want to touch on the 24 by 7? Well, I think... Uh... I think the, the current world, and this goes to the comment earlier about the text moving faster than, you know, than we'd like everything else to catch up with us. But, you know, the, the a lot of demographics, especially young people that, that kind of, uh, they can't fathom this 9.30 to 4 p.m., uh, you know, trading, trading hours. So, um, yeah, like, what, you know, why, why not? Why can't we trade on the weekends? Why do we have to wait until 9.30 on Monday? And and um so yeah i mean i think i think the market's coming close to demanding it when you have everybody just walking around with a, a trading platform in their pocket on their phone and you know they, everybody wants instant everything these days so um it's i think everything's eventually just going to move in this direction 24 7 for all markets yeah i i would agree with alan um we 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 already have the infrastructure built for 365 24 7. it'll be up to the issuers the way we're approaching it to determine because you know there's these are private markets so you can you can put up um, uh, restrictions in regards to trading really up to the issuers uh, we're um, we're focused on the globe and but not putting feet on the on the ground in Asia and and Europe necessarily it's more about um, having strong partners on the ground and bringing our regulatory compliance and our tech savvy into some types of partnerships but we are thinking about 365 24 7 we're we're ready for it now and i'm sure uh scott and alan and, and everyone else on this team is ready for it um and when we launch uh you know what we've heard from issuers is similar to what scott just said which is hey let's let's make sure everything's working properly in regards to our institutional base or investor base they're comfortable with it and then eventually move to 365, 24, seven, but I, I agree with Alan, it, it's going to happen. And it's one of the benefits, right? Uh, of, um, of, you know, smart contracts, which is what we're working with, eliminates poor documentation, it's real time data. Why can't you trade if Elon Musk comes out with some comment or Twitter post on a Saturday night and uh, rather than wait till Monday morning? 
Um, so, so I mean, the tech, the tech is there now for that. Yeah, well, we're, we're already uh, 24-7, 365, so hence I'm a uh, yeah, big proponent, obviously. <laughs> yep. And you're leading by example, Alan. you got the INX token, and that's going all right, right? Yep. yep. Awesome. And I think uh, we have another question here from Dave Hendricks for, for Talo. <laughs> Will we see trading windows before we see 24 by 7? Anyone? Uh, is that an option ahead of it? Um, I mean, I'll take a stab. I think, uh, you know, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, you know, if you consider U.S. markets today, you know, the, the core hours are 930 to 4. But, um, you know, we've seen trading and we, we can allow for trading for obviously a much more expanded day. I think that's what, you know, what Dave is, is commenting on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do think that that, you know, it, 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 it could it could reasonably make sense that, um, you know, before it goes to seven days a week, they can go to, you know, uh, a full expanded day, which, you know, in U.S. equity markets is, um, you know, I guess 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or, you know, it could go five days a week and, and skip the weekends. Uh, I don't think that's out of the question. But I agree with, you know, people on, on the panel. Uh, we're ready for um, TZO is ready for the 24 hour trading. I think it's it's kind of a wait and see from our standpoint. Um, I think you, you will see it this year. Um, but, you know, to Pat's point, it, it's going to be, you know, largely predicated on what the issuers are looking for. Uh, I think, um, you know, a, as we continue to grow that 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 base. And Scott, that could be the evidence that you're looking for, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, l listen, I, I think we're going to see as we're all anticipating, you know, the next 12 months are really going to drive this all forward. And it's going to start to create an environment that will ultimately push us towards where Alan and Pat said, which is, you know, it'll be commonplace for the 365, 24 by 7. Nice. All right. And uh, segueing of it into another innovative part that I found pretty interesting, DeFi. We've talked on it a lot. <laughs> um, Richard and maybe Pat, you know, we can uh, co-team co this one. Talk to us about the potential of DeFi and how it enables investors to perhaps borrow against the deal. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, that's part of our longer term vision and, and, and why we set up the company was to, uh, you know, looking at all the innovation in DeFi and, you know, trying to harness that and bring that into a regulated securities context. So one of the you know, most well-known uh, you know, you know, pieces of functionality in DeFi is the crypto lending, where somebody deposits, you know, Ether into a lending protocol, they borrow a stable coin out of it, um, mm -hmm. and they have leverage, essentially. There's no reason we can't do that with security tokens. It's a different type of token and, and, and with, withdraw um, you know, a stable coin from that, allowing investors in these digital securities to to borrow against their holdings, which they can't often do these days. Um, and then I think there's you know other DeFi applications as well. Obviously, if, you, if you're including stable coins in DeFi, then yes, definitely a huge application for integrating stable coin settlement into the ATS so that you have you know, real time atomic settlement you know, far faster, far better than what you have in public markets right now. Interesting. Pat? Yeah, I, I agree with everything, you know, Richard said, uh, certainly on the lending platforms, think of it as uh, peer to peer margin lending opportunities. Uh, DeFi allows for that. Um, we uh, there's also uh, staking opportunities to create yield. Uh, there are, um, there's um, uh, paired trading in terms of uh, AMMs, automated market makers to provide liquidity. Um, there are a lot of very interesting yield enhancement uh, protocols that are on the market right now and um, that can be incorporated into different securities. So, um, yeah, we're looking at some some opportunities right now that are yielding uh, within a range anywhere between uh, high single digits to mid to high single digits to uh, low teens, which obviously in this the current environment, at least here in the U.S., is uh, would be extremely attractive, utilizing um, the DeFi space. Um, so, yeah, a lot of great companies out there. Fireblocks today, I, I think it was today, announced another five hundred million dollar raise. They're doing a tremendous amount on the uh, custodial side with more traditional institutions, <clears throat> and that'll um, that'll just, uh, in in our opinion, um, uh, turbo boost this 
you know, the growth into DeFi, uh, despite where the prices are right now. That, all this being said, uh, if you look at token prices, we're in crypto winners. So uh, despite that, you know, we we're 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 all here big believers in the blockchain and the opportunities with the tokens going forward. Great. Anyone else looking into DeFi? Any thoughts on that before we move on? All right. Um, and then shifting, we talked about the supply side. Now the demand side. Uh, what are you hearing from family offices, investors, um, the need for speed and transparency? It's an open question. Anyone want to chime in on that? I mean, I mean, I can jump in really quick, right? Is I, I think that momentum is picking up as well, right? We're in discussions with a whole host of family office and IRAs. And I think, you know, really, I keep using the word momentum, right? But I think it's an important word in the space that we're all operating in. Because, you know, everyone is trying to understand this stuff, uh, you know, in a way that we haven't seen, you know, over the past 12 months. But there is such engagement now across the spectrum that I think, you know, Definitely, you will start to see the institutions not only dipping their toes in and the family offices and the RIAs, but you'll actually start to see them engage in a meaningful way. And so I think it's been exploratory, right? We're in a host of conversations every single day. And, you know, a good part of our role is educating, right? Is the, you know, we're getting really great questions. Um, and, you know, we're working closely to try and give these folks a, a good understanding of, you know, the ecosystem and how it works and how it compares to traditional capital markets. And so, you know, again, back to, you know, the word momentum, I think, you know, from the ground, we're really seeing it pick up. And so I'm very optimistic. Mm. And Alex, uh, we had a good chat uh, and you talked about the variability in investor types, right? These are mostly buy and hold individuals coming from, a, you know, those traditional markets. Um, is it more about the access to greater availability of securities on the blockchain, or is it um, where they're looking at sort of the benefits of the blockchain in terms of speed and accessibility? Talk to us about that. I, I mean, look, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the traditional markets has, you know, has been, um, I don't want to say monopolized, but I think the traditional markets has a an investor base. People are interested in what it is, and um, you know, people go their whole lives and, and have never been interested in Wall Street, as an example. But you know, with the uh, I guess with the introduction of crypto markets, crypto uh, currencies uh, as uh, security tokens had advanced and, and progressed since the you know i guess the, the you know 2000 you know 15 and on i think that you're seeing a a much more expanded universe of potential investors people you know you have kids today you know teenagers frankly buying nfts or, or invest trying to you know find different crypto products out there that you know 20 years ago no one would ever have suggested or, or, or expected a teenager to, to purchase a stock it, it just wouldn't have happened unless their father was, you know, a, a stockbroker or, you know, some other finance executive. It's just not something that would have been interested. They would have been interested in. So I think that the um, the universe of potential events, investors have expanded quite a bit. And uh, that brings good and bad to us, right, to the marketplace at large. You know, it probably, um, you know, from a compliance standpoint, it, it, it's going to require us to remain vigilant and make sure that, you know, there is um, – compliance with all suitability rules and things of that nature uh but from a from an investor investor access standpoint i think it just opens up a, a tremendous opportunity for us to continue to you know, um a broader universe of potential users and investors mm. it's a very good yeah. point about how i had to i had to give my son a lesson yeah. on covered calls the other day i mean this, <laughs> we, 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 we were kids we didn't we didn't have any clue what was going on with this stuff yeah. Uh, if I if I may just quickly in regards to family offices, um, you know, generational wealth. Most generational wealth is in real estate. I mm -hmm. you know I I think it's eighty to ninety percent of most family offices. Many of their holdings are in real estate, and again, it's over generations. Um, so we're I, I uh, just concurring with Scott's comments. Uh, we we're 
in discussions with a number of uh, family offices. Uh, most of it revolves around tokenizing real estate, mm -hmm. uh, cash flow, uh, structured products. It's we think there the use cases there are there are strongest versus um, just equities. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we're we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest, and family offices tend to tend to uh, you know be at the forefront of new venues like cannabis. A lot of family mm -hmm. offices got into cannabis back in the thousands and now the same things happened in crypto and eventually digital asset securities but the hook that we've seen is real estate because you know these family offices know real estate really well yeah yeah we we speak to a lot of family offices and i think it just, it just comes down to the quality of the deal at the end of the day there's a bit of a discussion about tokenization and what that means but at the end of the day, they want to see the numbers on, on, on the company, on the, on the real estate asset or whatever it is. And if that makes sense and fits with their investment uh, thesis, mm -hmm. then, then they're going to be interested. The liquidity is kind of a bonus for them. It's not something they've had before. And a lot of family offices do have longer term money. So I think that's something that, they, that that's going to be kind of, you know, as we grow this liquidity, I think that's going to get them even more hooked on, on the product, as it were. I want to tell a kind of a, a kind of a funny story. We're talking about kids getting involved in the next generation and so forth. I was speaking to one real estate sponsor um, who we're working with, and he came to me and he said, um, I'm working on these projects and I'd like to work with you guys. I'm going to do some tokenization. He goes, listen to me. I don't need money. I can get, I've got all my investors. I can get all the investors I want, but I'm worried. All my investors that in real estate, they're all 69 years, the average age is 69 years old. I'm worried about the next generation and what they're, what, 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 when that money flows down to the next generation, what are they going to want to put it in? So I want to be ahead of the curve and have my real estate tokenized with someone like you. So I think that's something we're going to be seeing a lot more of. He was a very forward thinking chap, but I think others are going to come and start going that way as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, and if I may, you know, we, we I concur a hundred percent. I think, you know, 40% of our, you know, total, you know, um, um, uh, you issue a base that's coming to us, uh, prospects that is, uh, 40% are in the real estate market specifically, you know, just, to, you know, as a, as a, a, in lockstep with what you just said, I think that, um, they are looking for expanded universe and they are trying to understand, you know, who the next investors are. So, uh, Rich, it's a great anecdote. And I think that, uh, you know, we're seeing that across the board. Nice. Awesome. And I know this 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 group is more like unconstrained portfolios, right? So the alt space is not as conservative as most people think. Um, and we have a question here for Richard from Sumana. Um, are there any platforms that are currently or you are working towards providing leverage for security tokens? If not, when do you expect this to happen? Well, it's on our roadmap. I'm not going to say it's imminent, but it's something we're looking at. Um, but and I'm sure other folks are as well, uh, you know, on, on this call here. So I don't, I don't think we'll see it. I think when you get a bit more critical mass, you may, the, you know, it is, you know, a, a fair bit of counterparty risk. I don't know what the loan to value would be on it. It could, it could be as much or even as more, more than the crypto market because you've taken on very stock specific risk. Maybe there's a solution where it's more kind of portfolio based um, margin. Margin not really the right word, but portfolio based lending so that the, the, the lender can have more diversified and lower risk to it. So it's going to come. I don't think it's going to happen right away, though. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things we're seeing is, you know, OTC uh, issuers that uh, that are the stocks are getting kind of decimated by by shorters out there or naked shorters or, and so you know you, you mm -hmm. can't short a security token right now, and so some of them are, are considering you know uh, doing away with their OTC listing, tokenizing mm -hmm. their stock instead, <laughs> and, uh, and and pushing all the shorts out. So it's. Uh, it's, kind of, it's an interesting payments that we've seen a lot of in the last year. Got it. Nice. I've been taking a bunch of notes because I'll be writing up an article afterwards for Coindesk. Uh, so very interesting stuff. Um, and I think we're hitting up near the mark. Um, any last comments from our panelists to, to chime in before we head off? I want to open up the floor. I, well, I just want to thank you, Dominic, uh, the folks at ARC, uh, the, my fellow panelists. Uh, we need more of this, and there's, uh, you know, our conference uh, um, schedule is filling up already for the remainder of the year. So um, I'm quite excited about that. As digital asset securities or, or um, digital digital assets in general, away from crypto to crypto, becomes more uh, part of the mainstream discussion in this 
in this universe. So, uh, you know, I want to thank all of you for uh, being a part of this from an educational standpoint. And, you know, at the end of the year, I look forward to a year out from now and looking back on 2022, which I, I do think will be a pivotal year. Great. And I yeah. know speaking with all of Go ahead. No, I was good. Um, uh, Dominic, I was just going to give my final comments here. I guess, you know, w wanted to, of course, uh, thank um, Arca and, and you, Dominic, for uh, uh, hosting us here. I think uh, I, most importantly, I definitely want to thank you know, this esteemed panel. I think that, um, you know, this space, you know, eight years ago, I would have stood here alone. Today, I think the panel alone is a testament to, you know, where this industry is going. And I'm super excited to see where, you know, everyone goes and, you know, how the, we mature as a group and as an industry. Yeah. I, I, I'll kick in just real quick to right and thank Arca uh, and you, Dominic, as well. I mean, we're thrilled to be part of this. I think aside from this panel itself, right, is we're starting to see other platforms start to come on sort of with uh, with rapid speed here. And so I think it's a testament to, you know, the industry itself and, and the opportunity ahead of us all. And so, you know, I look forward to collaborating, you know, with this group on a go forward basis to drive this all forward. Yeah. Rising tide floats all boats. So, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Still a good year ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely power in numbers. I know speaking with all of you individually, you know, I, I always see the, the common thread throughout. So uh, a consortium of sorts, I think it's, it's great uh, to kind of see this happen. And a lot of innovation. I know, Sean, you're working on some really good stuff. Um, so more to come. And I look forward to, to hearing all about it. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll definitely keep in touch. And thank you to all of our, our uh, listeners and viewers. Have a good one. Thank you, Dominic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.